In scripture, a sign is a demonstration of God's favor. As we are told in the 86th Psalm, and David is speaking, show me a sign of thy favor. He wants a sign, a certain sign, a definite sign, by which he leads his people out of Egypt. The journey is from darkness to light, from bondage to freedom, from death to life. So while we are here in this world, a world of death, a world of bondage, a world of darkness, there are certain signs, and we ask for the sign of your favor to start the journey out of this world of bondage into freedom, out of death into life. In the 78th Psalm, one whose name is Asa, the word means to gather together like a historian. Twelve are attributed to this one called Asa. He is the gatherer. He is the historian, and he begins the story. He said, give me your ears. He's asking for attention to those that he will address. And then he said, I will open my mouth to you in a parable and utter dark sayings from of old. And then he recites the Exodus. That is, he recites the signs in the book of Exodus. All the signs and the wonders and the miracles of God. But he begins by telling us it is a parable. Well a parable is a story told as if it were true. Leaving the one who hears it to discover its fictitious nature, its character, and extract its true meaning. Just what it is trying to tell man. It's difficult to tell these stories on this level. So they're told in the form of, well, signs and wonders. In the very end of this song, he said, And the Lord awoke as like a man out of strong, strong drink. He was buried in wine, as it were. And then he called David. The Lord awoke as from a dream, a deep, deep sleep imposed as though he had excessive wine. And then he called David. And then it goes on to show the story of David. But first of all, we must remember it is a parable. Paul tells us in his letter to the Galatians, which is considered the first letter or the first book of the New Testament. It's not chronologically so today, but it is chronological as far as it's dating though. It's the first portion of the New Testament. And he tells us the story of Abraham is an allegory. If the story of Abraham is an allegory, well then the story of Jesus it's an allegory. For the New Testament begins on these words. Here is the book. Here is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it goes through the genealogy. Well, if the story of Abraham is an allegory, then the story of Jesus is an allegory. Yet behind the allegory, behind the parable, there is a tremendous truth. See, there are two histories in the world. History is simply what occurs. What actually occurs is history. But what man likes to remember is legend. And there is a legend. Scripture is the legend. That too is history, but it's divine history. It's the history of salvation. 
that will be forever and forever. Human history will pass away and leave not a trace behind it. I don't care how we try to map our faces on the mountain sides and build monuments to ourselves. I make all kinds of statues, they will all crumble and pass away. Everything that man has ever accomplished in this world will all vanish. But divine history is forever, it's like a standing order. Something to be done absolutely and continuously. So that not one being in this world experiences the signs and the wonders. Everyone will experience the signs and the wonders. And when he experiences these signs and wonders, then he reinterprets scripture in the light of his own experience of scripture in the signs and wonders. He realizes what the birth really means. When we are told, as Simon tells us, the child, this little child called the Christ child, is a sign for the fall and rising of many in Israel. It's a sign. The whole story of Jesus, if you understand it, is a sign. Everything about it, all the things about him, are all signs. And the story will unfold itself in you, individually. God's mightiest act, in the light of which all the other signs and wonders of Jesus' career are understood is the resurrection. That begins the signs and wonders. The individual's resurrection is simply equivalent to the coming of Christ. When you are raised, and you will be, it is simply equal to the coming of Christ. And it doesn't come from without, it comes from within. Today, here we are, all of these great evangelists, highly publicized, speaking to millions of people, and they're waiting for him to come from without. Hopefully they'll be here to greet him. They'll wait in vain. He cannot come from without, because he's already within us. The crucifixion is over, and it did not take place 2,000 years ago. It took place in the beginning of time. That's when God was buried in man, for a purpose. Not because of anything that was wrong, just for a purpose. He took the limit of contraction, which is man, that he may expand. By coming down to the very limit of contraction, then God could expand. For expansion is forever. Forever and forever. There can be no limit to the expansion of God. In order to expand, he first contracts. And man is the contraction that he took upon himself. And this is the only cross in the world that he ever bore. He was never crucified on a wooden cross. Oh, I presume there's some nut in the world to command and actually crucified him on a wooden cross, no question about it. That some distorted mind did it as we hang people and do these things to each other. But the actual cross spoken of in scripture is the human body. That is the cross on which God is crucified. And as we are told, if we have been crucified with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we found union with him in a crucifixion like his. We are all crucified. I am. You are. Therefore, when we are individually raised from the dead, we shall find union with him in a resurrection like this. And everyone is going to be raised, but raised out of this body, not out of some little tomb in the cemetery. It doesn't matter where you drop this little garment, whether it's pulverized by a bomb, whether it's cremated 
as so many of us today require, or whether it can be disintegrated in the land. It doesn't really matter. It's not there that you are. This is the tomb of God. This is the sepulchre of God. And here, and only here, we rise, and we rise from within. And these are the signs and the wonders. It begins with the resurrection. And the very night of the resurrection, within a matter of moments following the resurrection, is the birth from above. Symbolized in the imagery of scripture as a little shire wrapped in swaddling clothes. Which Simeon said, it is a sign given to us for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. In other words, here is the sign. You can either accept it or reject it. You accept it as the sign, as Matthew tells us, of Emmanuel, God is with us. For this is the name given to the child. God is with us. When you see the child, and for that moment, it is God that is born. But who is born? You are born. You are the one who actually begins to awake. You awake within your own skull. And when you are completely awake, as you have never been awake before, you find yourself completely entombed within your skull. That's the sepulchre. And you are all alone, and no one helps you to get out. But you have an innate wisdom. You know exactly what to do. And you do it. You push the base of your skull, and something gives. It actually gives. And as it gives, it opens, a very small opening. And you push your head from within your skull, you push it out of your own skull. Therefore, you are not the skull. This thing you think to be yourself now is only a garment that you are wearing. Because you, the real you, in an entirely different body, you come out. And this is not your body. This is only a garment that you are wearing. As much as this is the garment that the body now wears, this flesh and blood is the garment that I wear. And you come out from the base of your skull and you squeeze yourself out just like a little child being born from the womb of a woman. Only this time it's from the skull, not from the womb. And when you come out, the imagery of scripture, all the signs and wonders surround you. Here are the witnesses to the event. And they come suddenly, unexpectedly. Suddenly they appear, and there they are. Three, in my case, as scripture describes them, there were three. In my case, there were three. They were my brothers, my older brothers, and there were three of them. And the wind, the unearthly wind, is present. You can't quite describe it, but wind and spirit are the same in Hebrew and in Greek. So the wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it. But you cannot tell whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And here is this unearthly wind. And you are disturbed because it's just like a storm, a terrific storm. And as you look, thinking it may come from there, then one of these on the bed where your body lay. Or here you came out of the body and the body's on the bed. It's ghastly pale. And one gets up to investigate the source of the wind. And as he goes one or two feet, he is attracted by something on the floor. And he lifts what is on the floor and it's an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. And he announces what the infant is. And he calls you by your earthly name. In my case, it's Neville. He said, it's Neville's baby. The other two, they said in the most incredible voice, how can Neville have a baby? He doesn't argue the point. He presents the evidence. And here he places on the bed an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then I took the infant in my hand. And looking into its face, I said, how is my sweetheart? A heavenly smile broke upon its face. And then it was caught up. 
out of my hands, and the whole vision came to an end. That's the first night. But it begins with the resurrection. This is not a story of this world at all. So when we are told the story, as Tennyson said, truth embodied in a tale shall enter in at lowly doors. We are incapable on this level of grasping this profound truth. So it is told to us in the form of a tale that you will tell to a child. And so my mother told me the tale. Then I went to school and they repeated the tale. And then I went through life and they repeated the same tale. And then when I'm a man, a completely mature man, then it happened in me. And then I had to reinterpret scripture in the light of my own experience of scripture. Now I know it is not historically true. As we understand history, if by history means secular history, it is not historically true secularly. Yet it is divine history, something that is taking place forever and forever. And at the appropriate time, the individual is drawn into that thing that is always taking place. And then he who is buried in the individual awakes, and he is God. It's the story of the birth of God, who deliberately came down and assumed the limitations of the thing called man. But he is not man, he is God. And you are God. Every child born of woman is God. The very moment that he breathed, that was God. That was the breath of God. But he must go through the horrors of the world. Why? Time will prove why. We must suffer. Why we must actually go through all the experiences and the pain of this world. But when you think of the end, the result, then I presume it will all vanish as though it never were. When you think what actually takes place as a result of our sufferings when we became man. So the signs and the wonders by which God led his people out of Egypt. Now, Egypt is not on the north coast of Africa. The world is Egypt. America is Egypt. Russia is Egypt. Everything in the world, this earthly state, is Egypt. It's a world of darkness, a school of educated darkness. And we are laid out of this school of educated darkness into light. We are laid out of bondage into freedom. We are laid from death, for well, this is death, everything here decays. It appears, no matter how glorious it is, it appears it's so lovely, it's altogether wonderful. And then it waxes, it wanes, and it vanishes. Everything dies. I don't care what it is, it all dies, everything. We are told today by our scientists that the very stars are slowly dying. Trillions and trillions of light years, but they die. That everything dies. So here we are in a world of death, and we are being led out of death into eternal life. And you are that eternal one, and you cannot die. No one in this world can really die. You die, yes, burn it up, and you see it turn to ash. But the being who occupied it is instantly restored to life in a world terrestrial just like this. That's not resurrection. That is restoration. Resurrection is something entirely different. That comes at the end of the journey. When man has gone through the entire gamut of human experiences, then at that moment in time, his father within him, which is himself, his true identity is God the Father. He awakens him. And as he awakens, he comes out. And then the imagery of scripture, he experiences, but he is cast in the central role. He is an actor, the star actor in the role. He is not an observer. He observes what happens, but he is the actor, the central actor in the part. And if this is a story of Jesus Christ as told in scripture, and you experience that, well then you are Jesus Christ. 
And Jesus is only another name for Jehovah. Same root, yod he vav begins Jehovah. It begins Jesus, which in Hebrew is Joshua. So it is simply the same being, and you are that being. It's the story of you. And I wouldn't care if the whole vast world rose in opposition to what I've just told you. It would make no difference to me whatsoever, for I couldn't deny it. I could no more deny what I've experienced than I could the simple evidence of my senses. I am touching this piece of wood here. And I can't deny that I am touching this little lectern. Well, I could no more deny this than I could deny what I've told you, or I've experienced it. I am not speculating. I am not theorizing. The story of Jesus unfolds itself within the individual. And when it does, he has escaped the world of death. So David could say, What can flesh do to me? Thou hast redeemed me. And in the end, you are completely redeemed. And the being, the being that stands before you to prove who you are is David. You would not let me rest in hell, said he. Thou hast redeemed me. And David is simply the personification of humanity. Having played all the thoughts that man could ever conceive, good, bad, and indifferent, yes, the thief and the judge, the one who is beheaded and the one who beheads, the king and the serf, the giant and the dwarf, have played them all. And having played them all, there's nothing else to play. And so you come to the end of the journey. When you come to the end of the journey and you've borne your part of the allotted time, well then, you have not a thing to do, but awake. And in that moment you awake. And you remain long enough to tell it to your brothers. For every one of the world is your brother. And everyone in the world not only is your brother, but he is your very self. You will reign in the end as one man, Jesus Christ. Only one without loss of identity. Everyone will be the Lord Jesus Christ. And there will be no loss of identity. So I don't care what you have done, what you are doing, what you plan to do, all your hopes, in the end, you are the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is nothing but the Lord Jesus, who is one with Jehovah. He is God the Father. And you, eventually will discover yourself to be God the Father. And these are the signs and wonders has nothing to do with history. But if you look at it, it's a tradition of doubtful certainty. You read the 78th Psalm, which is only magnifying the signs and wonders of the book of Exodus. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Sayings that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. And now I will not hide them from their children, but I will tell them to the coming generation these things that God has wrought. And then he itemizes all these fantastic signs and wonders. Read the signs and they all unfold within you. But when they unfold within you, they are so unlike what they appear to be when you put them down in the written form. That wonder child spoken of in Isaiah, and you see it in Isaiah, and a child shall be born, not of any virgin, as the churches teach, just the wonder child is born, and his name is Emmanuel. God is with us. And unto us we are told in the ninth chapter of Isaiah, a child is born, and a son is given. And then we name the four names or titles of that one. One of them is Father, Everlasting Father. 
And here is this something unfolding in you. Well, how am I a father? I am a father. I have a son, 47 years old. And I have a daughter, 29 years old. But that's not the fatherhood of which the Bible speaks. It speaks only of the one child. Well, here we are told in Genesis that Abraham had a son and he named him Ishmael. Twelve years later, he had another by promise and it was named Isaac, meaning he left. Yet in the story, and the Lord speaks and tells him he only has one son and that son is Isaac. Now, the Lord is not a liar. And yet the Lord named the first one himself and he said, call him Ishmael, which means God hears. And in spite of the name given to the child, he tells him he doesn't have any more than one son. And that son is Isaac, which means he laughs. And that's the one son. You hold him in your hand and he breaks into the most heavenly smile. That's the sign. And all the signs of scripture are true, but they are not what the world would call secular stories. They are not. They can look forever, all through the Near East, to try to find the tomb of this one and the tomb of the other one. And all the little things they think they're going to find, they'll not find them. For this is not of this earth. This is entirely different. There are two histories. Secular history, which will vanish and leave not a trace behind it. And divine history is forever and forever. And the very last one experiences the story of Jesus. And when the very last one, then the whole curtain comes down on the play. And we all one. We all form the one being, the one body, the one spirit, the one Lord, the one God and Father of all. And there is no other. So I'm not telling you that you should not aspire and try to be greater than you are today. No. Keep on making every effort to transcend your present state. Do it. It's all within the book for you to do it. Dare to live in the end of your dream as though it were true. And it will become true. Just as Frost told us, Robert Frost, our founding fathers did not believe in the future. They believed it in. They didn't believe in the future. That something is going to happen regardless of what I do. It will happen because of what I do. Everything in my world is like imaginal activities projected. And I will make a better world or a more horrible world, depending on my imagined activities. But that's in something entirely different from what's taking place in me, which is the story of Jesus unfolding. And it comes suddenly. It erupts without any warning whatsoever. But the things on the outside, if I know what I have imagined, I can tell what's going to happen in my world. I don't need the stars. The stars, they're Buddhist, as you're told in Shakespeare. It's not in our stars, but in ourselves that we're underneath. Don't look to the stars to give you any direction as to what's going to happen to you, or to any teacup leaves, or monkey bones, or anything else. It's not there. It's all in your own wonderful human imagination. Tell me what you're imagining, and I'll prophesy for you. If you are faithful to that imaginal act, if you dare to assume that you are the man that you want to be, and remain faithful to that assumption, I can predict what you're going to be, if you remain faithful to it. And it's not based upon any star or anything else outside of you. It's all within your own wonderful human imagination. But no matter what you accomplish in this world of Caesar, it will all vanish. It is what was predetermined before that the world was that interests me. And that's all written in Scripture in the signs and the wonders. And so his life, Jesus' life, you understand what it means, is a sign. His whole life is a sign, if you understand it. 
And that whole life is going to repeat itself in the individual without the change of identity of that individual. You don't change from Neville to Jesus. You're still Neville. But you are the Lord Jesus Christ. A friend of mine, when I was in San Francisco in July, he's here tonight and he wrote me a letter. He said, I've had the most exciting vision that I have ever had. He said, in my vision, a woman said to me, Neville has risen. Then pointing down the corridor, she said, look, at the end of the corridor was this effulgence of light, golden pulsing living light. And I knew that you were my friend, the man Neville that I know. Yet I knew that you were the Lord. I knew that at your home, it is always an open door for me. I could come to your home any time of the day and you would welcome me without an invitation. Yet at this moment, I felt this needs a special invitation. And so I hesitated to go. But I knew that if I went, went down that corridor and turned off into the area where the light came in this enormous profusion, I would enter into the Holy of Holies. Yet I knew that you were my friend. A man that I know in this world, and yet I knew you to be the Lord, the risen Lord. Now, he wrote me that letter, and I was there after my first week. I got it the second week that I was there. He said, it was my most exciting vision, but I knew I was not invited. But I also knew that you always said to me, I will appear to you, and I will show you who I am. I have told many of you that, and I will. I have appeared to many, because it has happened in me. It's not anything to brag about, but as Paul said in his letter, the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians, I must boast. There is nothing to gain from it. But I know a man in Christ who, was lifted up 14 years ago into the third heaven. Now whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. But I do know a man in Christ who was lifted up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Now he tells us he saw and heard what cannot be uttered. It's stated in certain, I would say, translations that it's not lawful. It isn't that it's not lawful. You can't find words to tell it. There's nothing unlawful about telling about experience, but how are you going to find the images to tell it? You saw and heard things that are not lawful to be spoken. It isn't it's not lawful, but how on earth are you going to describe an age that has not a thing to do with this? You're lifted up into an entirely different state. And when people ask a question, they expect you to give them an answer in terms of their current background of thought. Well, you can't do it. They expect to, uh, well, all right, you went to dinner tonight and you went to Chasen's maybe. They want a better Chasen. It isn't Chasen's. They want something, a better transportation. It isn't there. It's something entirely different. And you can't find any images on earth to couch the experience. So Paul said it was not lawful for man to utter. They were unutterable utterances. Well, how are you going to do it? How will I explain to anyone actually what happened in me? I did it to the best of my ability and I tried to tell it in my book, Resurrection. But did I succeed? I told it to the best of my ability. In my book called Resurrection, the last chapter bears the title of the book. But I can tell you if I succeeded or not. Because how am I going to find images here when they do not exist here? To describe the experiences of Scripture when man experiences the story of Jesus. 
And he knows who he is. He knows who he is. But he doesn't change his identity. He only knows he is the Lord. He knows he is the father of David, as told us in Scripture. And I will tell of the decree of the Lord, said David. He said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. And then David, in the 89th Psalm, the Lord now speaks, I have found David. And he has cried unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. So here we have confirmation of it. He finds. The father calls him son, and then the father finds him. And he calls the father, my father. Well, I have experienced it. But how am I going to experience it? I tell it so that it can go over to a mind that has been so conditioned to believe in a secular world. The Bible is not speaking of anything about this world. You can look forever and you aren't going to find any tomb where Jesus was buried. In spite of the churches. So they had the Holy Sepulchre. And some little thing built over it. And they called that the Holy Sepulchre. Then they find another place they call that where David was buried. And the archaeologists and wise men have given years and years of study to their science. And they're all men of great degrees, but it's more than scholarship. It takes much more than scholarship to understand scripture. You have to experience scripture before you can begin to understand how altogether wonderful it is. And if you don't experience scripture, you can just go all around the bush and miss it. You can't find it because it's not a secular story. The Bible is not of this world at all. It's an entirely different world of a different being. And that being is in this world clothed in a garment of flesh and blood. And that is only a garment. It is not the being that is clothed. The being that is clothed has a garment that you can destroy this now. And that garment that he really wears cannot be touched by anything in this world. It can never be destroyed. We have a body that is immortal, that is imperishable, and it cannot be destroyed by anything known to man in this world. This body will die, yes, this will die. It could go tonight, as far as I'm concerned. If there's work for me to be done in this world to do, all right, I'll be here to do it. Because there's a time for everything. And so time to be born, a time to die, time to laugh, a time to cry. So I came in on time, and I'll go on time. I came in on cue, I'll go on cue. Whether it be a violent exit or a normal natural exit. From old age or what they call a heart attack. I don't care what they call it. They'll give it some kind of a name. Because in this world of Caesar, we have to have a name for everything. Because it's insured. You aren't going to pay the insurance unless you can just prove that it had some reason for going. But I say, I came on time. I'm going on time. I know doctor in the world will prolong my departure one hour. I've taught in scripture. Who by being anxious can add one hour to his span of life. Really carefully. It used to be thought that it meant one cubit, which would be say 30 inches to his statue, like suddenly growing up 30 inches. No. The new translation, which is a far better translation of the Greek, who by being anxious can add one hour to his span of life. Can't. If you take it the word cubit, or even that would be a step, how can I add one more step than that which is the allotted portion of my world? I can't. I'll go on time. I came in on time. All these little plots and plans for men will go awry. They will not work out because the whole thing is perfect. And everyone will one day experience the entire story of Jesus within himself. But he will be cast in the role of Jesus without change of identity. He is the Lord. So I tell you, you are the Lord, Jesus Christ. And there is no other Lord Jesus Christ. He is buried in you and was not buried in any little thing in Jerusalem. 
He was buried on Golgotha. Golgotha is the Aramaic and Hebrew word for skull. Luke translates the word as it should be translated, skull. They do not give the Aramaic word, and he was actually crucified on a place called the skull. And he was buried near where he was crucified, and he was crucified on the skull. So that's where God is buried, buried in the skull of man. It is there that he's going to rise. He's going to rise in man. And when he rises in man, you are the Lord Jesus Christ. For in the end, there is only Jesus. There is nothing but Jesus. Now let us go into the silence.